One of the shortest verses in the entire Bible is John 11:35. Jesus wept. In the New Testament, Jesus has emotions, but there's one thing he never does in the Bible, which is laugh. But in the Gospel of Judas, Jesus is laughing all the time. He's laughing at his disciples when they are in prayer, giving thanks before they eat bread. He laughs at the disciples when they ask him simple questions. Jesus laughs at Judas when he tells him he has a vision. And Jesus even laughs at the error of the stars. The Gospel of Judas certainly paints a picture of a very different kind of Jesus than the one we find in the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But what exactly is the Gospel of Judas? Who wrote it and for what purpose? The Gospel of Judas is the most recently published ancient non-canonical gospel, released to the public for the first time in 2006. The general public has only been able to read this gospel for less than two decades, so there has been a ton of hype around this gospel. In 2006, National Geographic did documentaries, published magazines, and came out with critical translations of the gospel in various languages. People from all over the world were eating this information up. But there was one problem. This gospel is really difficult to understand. But before we get into any of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about where this gospel came from and how it was discovered. First and foremost, it's important to know that this is a Gnostic gospel and shows a clear lineage to Sethian Gnosticism. Gnosticism was an early sect of Christianity that combined aspects of the Old and New Testaments with Greek philosophy, ancient Roman magic, and even to Egyptian cosmology and theology. Gnosticism was the result of Christianity spreading in a Gentile world, where it crashed into other cultures with their own religions, philosophies, and ideologies. Despite the fact that so many things went into forming Gnostic theology, Gnosticism is actually a fairly early development within Christianity. Some scholars would go so far as to say that Gnosticism is the original form of Christianity. I personally am a bit skeptical of that. Gnosticism was viewed as a Christian heresy, and their writings were banned, destroyed, and often burned by so-called proto-Orthodox Christians. Which is why we are just now finding out about so many of these lost ancient Gospels. Because they were either buried in the sand someplace, or they were buried with Egyptian mummies, or even found in trash dumps. And these Gospels are not in great shape. They are fragmentary, which means they have holes in them and big chunks are missing. The holes in these manuscripts are called lacunas, and scholars have to try to put the pieces together that they do have, and other times they have to give their best educated guess as to what the missing pieces might have said. Most of the Gnostic scriptures we have today come from something called the Nag Hammadi Library, which is a collection of ancient Gnostic texts found in 1945 just outside the small town of Nag Hammadi, Egypt. There is also something called the Berlin Gnostic Codex, which contains Gnostic writings, including the famous Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Judas, however, doesn't come from either of these two documents. The Gospel of Judas is the third tractate, or book as we would call it, in something known as the Chakos Codex, and it occupies pages 33 through 58 of that codex. The Codex Chakos is named after a Swiss antiquities dealer named Frida Chakos Nussberger, who purchased the Codex in the year 2000 before knowing its importance. The Chakos Codex has four tractates in total. The Letter of Peter to Philip, the First Revelation of James, the Gospel of Judas, and Allogenes, sometimes called Allogenes the Stranger, to distinguish it from the Book of Allogenes found at Nag Hammadi. All tractates in the Codex Chakos were written in Coptic and has been carbon dated to around 280 CE, which is pretty early, and it's well over a century older than the Gnostic writings found at Nag Hammadi. The Gospel of Judas is written in Sahidic Coptic, which is one of the most common dialects of Coptic, and it's largely used by Christian Egyptian monks. Coptic is a sort of Egyptian hybrid language, and most of the Gnostic texts we have today are written in Coptic. Many scholars believe that the Gospel of Judas was originally written in Greek around the year 150 CE and later translated into Coptic to serve as scripture for Gnostic Egyptian monks. When the Gospel of Judas was first discovered is a little bit difficult to pinpoint, but we do know that it circulated on the antiquities market starting at around the late 70s. It was said to have been discovered in El Minya, Egypt, inside a limestone box. Many people and organizations knew that the Chakos Codex was ancient, but not a lot of people wanted to purchase it for a few reasons. The first one being that a lot of people didn't know if it was obtained legally or not, and they didn't want to get themselves into a legal bind. 
They also didn't know that the Chacos Codex contained the lost gospel of Judas, so people didn't know how much value this codex actually had. And it was on the market for somewhere in the ballpark of $3 million. And since most people couldn't read ancient Sahidic Coptic, most people didn't want to fork over that kind of cash for something they couldn't even read in the first place. This codex traded hands so many times and eventually ended up in a bank vault in Long Island, New York. This gospel was 1,800 years old and it wasn't being treated or handled very well. The Gospel of Judas that we have in the Chacos Codex is the only one in existence. No other ancient manuscripts of the Gospel of Judas has been discovered. Well, at least not yet. So we have nothing else to compare this Gospel to. And as you might be able to imagine, this codex was not handled very well, and it began to degrade over time. And there was an attempt to preserve it by freezing it. And this was a horrible failed attempt, and it literally ripped into thousands of pieces. So the Gospel of Judas we have today had to be reconstructed by experts in Coptic. And unfortunately, this restoration project still isn't finished. There are holes in this Gospel where we just don't know what was said. And if you have an English translation of this Gospel, there will be three little dots in the places where the text breaks off. Before we jump into what the Gospel of Judas actually says, I think it's important that we know a thing or two about its main character, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was one of Jesus' 12 disciples and is most famous for betraying Jesus with a kiss, which signaled to the Jewish authorities who Jesus was and led them to arrest him. Judas was paid 30 silver coins to betray Jesus. Jesus and Judas were friends, and Judas followed Jesus for about three years during his public ministry. Judas knew who Jesus was and presumably believed that he was the long-awaited Messiah. So the question that still plagues people today about Judas is, why did he turn Jesus over to the authorities? It seems like 30 pieces of silver is a small price to pay for betraying the Son of God. In the Bible, we have two seemingly very different versions of Judas's death. In the book of Matthew, Judas sees that Jesus is condemned to death, and Judas feels deep remorse and regret. So he throws the 30 pieces of silver back at the chief priests and elders in the temple and commits suicide by hanging himself. The elders and priests don't want to put the blood money in their treasury, so they use it to buy a field where they can bury strangers. And it's because it was purchased with the blood money that the field was called the Field of Blood. But in the book of Acts, Judas keeps the 30 pieces of silver and buys a field and falls down in that field and his intestines fall out and he dies. And that's why it's called the Field of Blood. However Judas died, unfortunately, the Gospel of Judas does not give us new information about his death. So far, I've actually been using an incorrect name for this gospel. I've been calling it the Gospel of Judas, which is what it's called in English translations. But it's important to know that that's really not a good translation of the name of this gospel. In the New Testament, in the canonical New Testament gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's always Eu Angelion Kata, which is Greek for the good news according to and then their name. So, Euangelion Kata Matthew, Euangelion Kata Mark, and so on. But that's not the case with the Gospel of Judas. The Kata, or the according to, is missing in the Gospel of Judas. So perhaps a better name for this Gospel is the Gospel of Judas, or the Gospel for Judas. This Gospel does not claim that Judas is the author. And even if it did, Judas was long dead before this Gospel was written. This gospel is not the good news of Jesus seen through the eyes of Judas. This gospel is the good news for Judas. Now this might seem like a small point, but it's actually really important when you're trying to understand what the gospel is really saying. Because one of the fun things about the gospel of Judas is trying to figure out if Judas is a good guy, or if he's a bad guy, or if he's an indifferent guy that's just predestined by God and he's just living out his destiny. Bible scholars and lay people alike struggle to know if the Gospel of Judas portrays Judas in a good light or in a negative light or in an indifferent light. If you've ever read the Gospel of Judas or if you plan to after this video, let me know down in the comments below if you think Judas is the good guy or a bad guy, if he's the hero or the villain. The Gospel of Judas has many passages that could go either way, and I, for the life of me, can't figure out what side I'm on. Sometimes he seems evil. 
and Gnostic scholars John D. Turner and April DeConnick would agree. Other times, Judas seems like the good guy, the guy Jesus gives secret knowledge to, and the guy who is actually freeing Jesus' spirit from his corruptible human body. In this way, Judas is the hero of the story and is the only disciple who truly knows what's what. Gnostic scholars Elaine Pagels and Karen King treat Judas as the hero. All right, enough background information. What does the Gospel of Judas actually say? The Gospel starts off by telling the reader that the information they are about to read contains the secret discussions and revelations that Jesus shared with Judas Iscariot over the course of a week, three days before his death. Then the Gospel of Judas tells us that he called his disciples and revealed to them the mysteries that transcend the world and what will happen at the end of time. Gnostic writings often contain secret information that Jesus gives only to a select few. Next, Jesus approaches the disciples while they are about to pray a prayer of thanksgiving before eating their bread, and Jesus laughs at them. The disciples are confused, and they wonder why Jesus is doing this, so they ask him. Jesus says he's not laughing at them, but laughing at the fact that their God wants to be praised in this way. The disciples are confused by this, and they ask Jesus, aren't you the son of our God? The implication here is that the answer is no, Jesus is not the son of their God. Jesus responds to the disciples by saying, how is it that you know me? Truly, I tell you, no generation will know me among the people who are with you. The disciples don't like that Jesus said this, so they start getting angry, and Jesus realizes they don't understand what he is saying. Then Jesus challenges them. He says, let any of you who is a strong enough person bring forward the perfect human being and stand before my face. No disciple except Judas is able to do this, although Judas technically looks away. Judas tells Jesus that he knows who he is and where he is from. Judas tells Jesus that he is from the immortal realm of Barbello. Barbello is the divine mother and the first emanation of the divine in Sethian Gnostic texts. Barbello's name probably derives from Hebrew, meaning God in four. This fourness refers to the Tetragrammaton, a transliteration of the divine name for God, Yahweh, spelled as Y-H-W-H. The Tetragrammaton existed to protect the divine name of God and to keep it holy by not spelling it out. And eventually, the Tetragrammaton wasn't even pronounced, a concept expressed in the Gospel of Judas. Jesus realized that Judas had this keen insight, so he told Judas to move away from the other disciples so he could tell him the secrets of the kingdom. So far, it would seem as if Judas is the hero, but this next section might throw a bit of a wrench in that theory. Jesus tells Judas that he will tell him the mysteries of the kingdom, not so that you can attain it, but you will go through a great deal of grief, for somebody else will take your place, so that the twelve disciples may be complete once again with their God. What are we to make of this? Judas will have this secret information about the kingdom of God, but yet he'll be filled with grief? Is he filled with grief because he knows what he has to do to get there, which would be killing Jesus? Or is he filled with grief because he knows he'll never be able to go to this wonderful place. Jesus then departs and then comes back to his disciples the next day, and they ask him where he went. And again, we get a strange response from Jesus. He says he went to a different generation, one that is great and holy. The implication here would be that the generation that these disciples are living in is a rebellious and weak generation. The disciples ask Jesus what generation this is, and Jesus laughs at them and asks why they even care. Then Jesus tells them that no one born of this realm will behold that wonderful generation. No human or even angel will be able to behold that generation. Jesus goes on and says even more, but the text breaks off here, so we don't really know what is said, and it's hard to put the pieces together. This next section is kind of like watching an old TV, and the signal's just not coming through very well. It's all broken up and really hard to understand. Then the story continues with the disciples telling Jesus that they had a vision the night before. The disciples begin describing their vision to Jesus. They see 12 priests with a crowd in attendance at the altar. The priests were sacrificing their own children, their wives, and they were having sex with other men and they were murdering people. These people were calling upon the name of Jesus. 
Jesus interprets this vision and tells them that they are the 12 evil priests because that is the God they serve. The sacrifices represent the multitude of people that the disciples are leading astray. They are ministers of error, and on the last day, they will be put to shame. This is classic Sethian Gnosticism. The God of the Old Testament is evil. And the disciples think they're worshiping the one true God, but they're not. They're actually worshiping a ruler of the underworld, as we'll see as we continue in this gospel. When the disciples heard what Jesus said, they asked Jesus to save them. Jesus basically says their destiny has already been written. He says, each of you has your own star. Stars in the gospel of Judas represent many things, but it likely comes from the Timaeus in Plato's writings. Thus, the gospel of Judas is influenced by Greek philosophy and Platonism. Judas then asks Jesus what the fruit of this generation produces. And Jesus, again, answers in a really strange way. He says the souls of all generations of people will die. When these people, however, bring the time of the kingdom to completion and the spirit parts from them, their bodies will die, but their souls will be alive and will be taken up. Now this is weird because this section makes it sound like this generation is good. But in the last section, Jesus just compared the disciples to people who were murdering their children and their wives. Then Judas tells Jesus that he had a vision and, yep, you guessed it, Jesus laughs at him and calls him the 13th diamond. Diamond could either mean spirit or demon and likely comes from another one of Plato's writings, the Symposium. Judas sees a huge house with really important people in it. And Judas asks Jesus if he can live there someday. Jesus responds by saying, Your star has deceived you, Judas. No person of mortal birth is worthy to go into the house you have seen. This next section is where it really starts to get weird. Judas asks Jesus if his seed is subject to the archons. Jesus responds by telling Judas to come with him so that he can see the kingdom of God and its entire generation. But Jesus again tells Judas that he will go through a great deal of grief when he sees it. So Judas starts to question if it's even worth it. And Jesus tells him he will be in the 13th realm and will be cursed by the other generations. But eventually, he will overrule them. Again, we have to ask, is this good or bad? Then Jesus becomes Judas's cosmic tour guide. And we get a glimpse into this heavenly kingdom, which reads a lot like a psychedelic drug trip. Jesus takes Judas to an infinite realm where the great invisible spirit is. The great invisible spirit is the highest expression of the divine power in Sethian Gnosticism. Then a cloud of light appears and the cloud says, let an angel come into existence as my attendant. Then a self-generated angel appears called the God of Light. Then more angels appear from a different cloud of light to worship the God of Light. Then the self-generated one created Adamus, which in Sethian Gnosticism is the perfect heavenly prototype for Adam. A heavenly form of Adam, you could say. This Adamus is known as an emanation, and he created the first luminary, presumably a type of powerful angel to rule over him. Then more angels come into existence, thousands to be exact. Then Adamus was the first in the cloud of light, and the text is broken apart here, but we can piece together that Adamus creates an angel, or perhaps he is referring to himself. But he reveals the incorruptible generation of Seth to the twelve luminaries. The generation of Seth comes from Adam and Eve's third child, Seth, which is where Sethian Gnosticism gets its name. Seth is of extreme importance in Sethian Gnostic writings. Then there is a description of all the luminaries, heavens, and firmaments that come into existence. Then the text changes to focus on the underworld. There is a multitude of immortal beings called corruption, and it is from corruption that the first human appeared. But the human has incorruptible powers. Then there are holes in the text again. But we can piece together that there is a cloud of knowledge and an angel named El Elith that appears with the generation of the humans. Then another angel appears from the cloud, and this angel has a face blazing with fire, and it is foul and bloody. This angel's name is Nebro, which means rebel. He is also called Yaldaboeth. Then another angel named Sakla comes from the cloud. Nebro, Yaldaboeth, and Sakla are Gnostic terms for the Demiurge, which is what the Gnostics refer to the God of the Old Testament as, the Demiurge, 
which comes from the Greek word demiouragos, which means the people worker, or more accurately, an artisan or a craftsman. This craftsman fashions the physical world, not necessarily creates it, but fashions it. And this is why the disciples are worshiping this God. They think this is the creator God, but they don't realize that this God comes from the underworld. This isn't the God of the Old Testament at all. This is Sakla, the Demiurge. Then there is a list of five angels, and the first is named Seth, and he is also called the Christ. And they are five angels that rule over the underworld and are the first over chaos. Sakla then says to his angels, let's create a human being after the likeness and the image of Adamus. They form Adam and Eve, then the text breaks up a bit, and it's hard to piece together what else is said here. After seeing this vision, Judas asks Jesus what benefit there is for a human being to be alive. Jesus basically just tells him not to be concerned about it and to live out your short life because the human spirit is on loan. Then the text breaks up again, but there is a discussion about souls living in flesh and Adam being given knowledge to rule over the spirits of chaos. The people of Sakla will be destroyed and Judas' star will rule over the 13th realm. Then Jesus laughs again and tells Judas he is laughing at the error of the stars and all of them will be destroyed. Then at the end of this gospel, we get what very well could be the most crucial line of all. Jesus tells Judas, speaking of the disciples, you will exceed all of them, for you will sacrifice the man who bears me. This part makes you think that Judas is the good guy. Judas sacrifices Jesus, which is good because it frees the soul of Jesus, which is really the true essence of who he is from this corruptible, rotten, dying human body. Finally, when Jesus dies, he's able to be his true self. Then at the end of this gospel, Judas sees the cloud of light and the stars that circle it, and the star that leads the way is his star. Judas walks into the cloud of light, and those standing around it heard a voice coming from the cloud. This conjures up images of Jesus in the New Testament at the Mount of Transfiguration. But unfortunately, again, we don't know what the cloud says here because the text breaks off. The gospel comes to an end with Judas receiving money and handing Jesus over to the Jewish priests and elders. This is such a strange gospel that has stumped scholars for almost two decades. This gospel doesn't give us historically reliable information about Jesus or his teachings, but it does give us a little bit of a window into early Christianity and how it morphed and adapted to the different religions, philosophies, and ideologies of the Gentile world. It shows us that early Christianity was a complex social structure that spread lightning fast, but in the process, changed and adapted to the world around it. And all of this happened within the first 100 years. If you've ever read this gospel before, consider dropping me a comment down below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you think of it. I think it's a bit strange. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel for more religious and historical content. And as always, stay thirsty for knowledge, my friends.